Welcome to the Swedish Junior Hockey Podcast. My name is Jacob Dahlin. I'm your host. And with us today is the head coach, uh, general manager for Norwich Sea Captains in the New England NA3 League. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Glad so, to be here. Uh, I had the pleasure. This episode is brought to you by Scandlux, your home for Scandinavian luxury products for the U.S. market. You can find us at scandlux.com. I guess last year was it last year that we yes. went up to yep. time flies and sure uh, does. <laughs> it seems a long time ago, but uh, had the pleasure of, of going up uh, on a visit with the, with the U 16 team last year. And uh, Kevin brought us, brought us into the house in, uh, in Norwich and, and, uh, and uh, got to meet some of the players and Kevin's a stand up guy. So tell us a little bit about, your background and a little bit about uh, the sea captains in the NHL. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I've been coaching for, uh, geez, I guess a little bit over a quarter century now. I started uh, on the women's side um, and I had a chance to coach at the collegiate level right away, which was unique. Um, and I, I, I gained some experience there at the Division One and Division Three levels. I coached at uh, Connecticut College and, and Providence College and Brown University and Ohio State University. And then I, I uh, Ohio State was my last job in the college game for a little bit. I left to, to go do some youth hockey things uh, in New Jersey, uh, grew a couple of programs there on the girls' side, to dabbled in some boys' hockey, coached a little bit of high school. Um, and then ironically, when I got married, uh, I was my wife's assistant coach for a couple of years on the, with the women's team at Wesleyan University. And then I, I jumped over to the men's game spent four years at Connecticut college and then coached Cheshire Academy, some uh, unique prep school hockey, some two season prep school hockey. So, so kind of a, a longer program and then made the jump to juniors. I spent one year in the EHL, the Connecticut chiefs, two years in Danbury with the NA three. And now I've just been starting my second year in Norwich. Um, you know, we built the Norwich thing from scratch. Uh, it's been, a really, really uh, challenging but rewarding experience. And I think for us, the biggest thing was trying to find our, like I knew the community would be a great spot. I knew the rink was a great setup. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, we knew that we would uh, be able to build with some relatively local players. Uh, it was just finding, finding our niche in recruiting and, and the types of kids that we would appeal to that had the character and, and the skill set and the desire to get better that I think you need to, to thrive in our program. So are you a new Englander from, from beginning or? No, I actually grew up outside of Philadelphia. Okay. Um, I, I grew up in a town called Doylestown in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, about an hour outside the city. And uh, I went nice. to high school there, played my hockey there growing up, played for the, the old glaciers who don't even exist anymore. And then for the little flyers um, and I played for my high school team as well. And then, and then your wife is still coaching. In yep. My, my wife's the head coach at Wesleyan university. Uh, yep. She's a Rhode Island native who played in Rhode Island her whole life and played at Brown. And then when she graduated uh, three months later, she was up at St. Lawrence. She was there for, I think it was nine years and then she's been at Wesleyan ever since. So I think she's going into her 13th or 14th year at Wesleyan. So she wow. had one year off when she was uh, assistant with the U S Olympic team and oh uh, nine, 10 season. But other than that, uh, just two jobs. It's funny. I always, you know, my, my resume takes, uh, to <laughs> run, the, runs a printer out of ink and, and hers barely fills a page. So, well, well that's gotta be some interesting, uh, uh, dinner conversations. I'm, I'm sure it's more about, um, uh, how to take care of your yard or something like that than, yeah. than, than hockey, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I think we've kind of got to a place where uh, I think we both have a lot that we're, we're, we're very different coaches. You know, she's, um, she's a lot more, she's a lot more uh, calm and, and I'm pretty intense. And um, I think for us, I think we value the same things, but I think we might go about getting there a little bit differently um, and, and even when it comes to the hockey side of things, like it's great to be able to, to talk about it with somebody and get their perspectives. And, you know, I love when she's able to watch our team play and tell me what she, what she sees. And, and I think the same holds true, vice versa. Um, you know, and now we've unfortunately, or, 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 or to our good fortune, I'm still not sure which, 
our <laughs> son's now playing too. So we've, we've really, we're really into it. So we're coaching, helping coach his team a little bit together as well. So it's, uh, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's all the time. Well, you could tell that uh, your your voice is uh, is uh, recovering. I know you had. Yeah, a game. it's always it's always recovering between yeah. now and, and and then the beginning of the you know the first time I go to a camp in the summer it it it, uh, it I lose it and for the first three weeks of the season it's it's hit or miss. That's so, right. Conditioning I've settled into my gravelly voice now. So yeah, that's right. Uh, so. Um, l- let's talk a little bit about, I thought, thought the subject of today, I think would be fitting because you've been in the game for a long, long time and you've seen throughout your career, um, the, 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 the difference between talent and mental toughness and, and how does, you know, how does that, um, show itself with new kids that are coming in and, and commitment and and that side. So I thought that that would be a good kind of um, track to go on sure. with with you because you, you've seen it um, not just at Norwich but throughout your career. Um, yeah, yeah. What makes so so? L- 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 let's talk a little bit about the NA three. You got kids that are coming in that are. Uh, what, what what's the age that the majority of them are coming in? Are they 18? You, yeah. Are, eight, have eight, they finished the U18s? Most are coming in at that most. So I think it's funny because I think in a perfect world, most of our guys would be 18, uh, you know, with a smattering of 17 year olds in that first year. I think what we run into is, and it's, it's obviously a big deal. I don't mean to minimize it when I say it, but is the high school piece, you know, like we, we get a lot of families and kids that want to be done with high school when they get to us. And, and they kind of have to be from a logistics standpoint, unless they're willing to do online because we practice in the, in the morning, 10 AM to noon. So it's really not conducive to a full-time high school student in a, in a brick and mortar setting. So, you know, so we get a lot of, we get kind of a split of 18 or 19 year olds typically Yep. Um, you know, I've started to make some inroads with some, some, some people and some individual kids and individual families about uh, trying to get here as an 18 year old. I do think it's advantageous to players to be here as 18 year olds and not just here, but you know, any junior hockey experience to start at 18, um, because the first year is an adjustment year. Yep. And so if you've got, if you're doing that as a 19 year old, and then you've only got one more year left. Um, it becomes really hard to take steps on the ladder. And that's what, you know, that's what 90% of our guys want to be able to do is, is, is step up on the ladder, get to the North American league um, and spend a, a meaningful time there before getting to college. So, you know, I do think it's easier if we get them as, as 17 or 18 year olds and they have that adjustment at that age. Um, and then there's more meat on the bone for an NA team taking a guy that they'll get, you know, they could conceivably get 120 games out of instead of 60. Yeah. So they're coming and, and I'm sure you're recruiting mostly there from the, from the uh, Northeast kind of cor- corridor. And, um, and yes and no. I mean, we, yeah. we do a good amount up here, but I mean, like if you look at our roster this year, we've got uh, two kids from Wichita, Kansas. We've got a kid from Texas. We've got two from Colorado. We've got uh, one from Alaska. We've got two North Dakota kids. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to, to, to spend a lot of my summers at different showcases and events where I get to meet people from all over the country and build some relationships. Um, and you know, that's where the majority of those kids come from is somebody says, I know a kid who would be perfect for you. And, you know, you see that kid play and, and you talk with him a few times and, and you make sure as best you can, that he's going to fit into to what you want to do. Um, our league does a good job in, in partnership with the North American League with our our showcases. Um, uh, you know, our our uh, the the combines, the NA combines, do a good job of, of attracting some quality players from all different uh, backgrounds and all different places. And, and those events are really good. We get all the contacts. We have the ability to you know to pretty easily connect with those kids. And there are a couple other. I go to the CCM showcase every year. Uh, which is, it's a big event and, um, you know, Mike Gempler runs, it does a really good job of, of making it 
pretty streamlined and getting some information out. I've made some good, gotten some really good kids out of that event. Um, so, you know, I, I always tell people, I think in a perfect world, our team would be a third uh, to about, I'd say a third Connecticut kids, a third, the rest of kind of the Northeast from yep. maybe the DC area up through Maine and, and, you know, through the Carolinas even. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the other third from parts elsewhere. I yeah. do think it's, it's, I do think it's great to have those kids that, you know, come from different places and come to the Northeast and get to experience living in new England. And, and I think those kids, uh, really enjoy a lot of the aspects of New England life that they don't necessarily know a whole lot about until they get here. And I think it's, I think it's pretty cool for the natives to kind of see the new guys come in and enjoy that stuff too. So how many of the guys this year? So I think I, I counted uh, maybe eight or so that are, that are Oh four birth year this year that, that are complete newbies coming into juniors. Right. Yeah. And then I guess one it, returning Oh four and then the rest of our Oh fours are new. Yeah. 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 And then any of the O threes are, are, are they, have they, are they, some of those guys are new as well. So we have, okay. so we have, uh, we have 11 returners and 14 new guys. So um, I'm not a hundred percent sure of that breakdown off the top of my head in terms of the O threes, but yep. I would say they're probably about, I mean, obviously all of our O twos are returners. They're none of them are new from other places. They're all, two-year Norwich sea captains. Um, yep. The O threes, I think there's probably one, two, it's probably about five or six of them. So they're probably split just about evenly. They're probably yeah. half new guys and, and half returners. So you're, you're about 12, 10, 12 games into the, to the regular season here. What's the, so, uh, you know, if we talk about the mental game, but what's the biggest challenge for, for them, if we look at it from the perspective of the player, um, I'm sure they're all super excited about leaving home and, and, and then they get up here and now they've been gone for two or three months. Yeah. And well, this is, and, and, and not to interrupt, but you just yeah, hit on, good. you just hit on one of the big things that I think every team has to go through and be mindful of is that, um, Yes. You know, we get, so we started practice on September. I think it was fifth this year, whatever we started practice on Labor Day. So um, that was our first day. And I met with everybody uh, after about 14 days, after about two, two weeks of practice, that third week I, I, I met with everyone and everybody's thrilled. Everybody's, you know, <laughs> the more like the, 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 the everything's just perfect. And, yep. and our, listen, our billets are great. Um, and they are great. And, you know, our location's great. And that's all, that's all true. The food um, is great. The, yeah. You know, that is great. The pillow is great. And, and, and I, honestly, like we, I, I can't say enough about our billets. I mean, we came to a community, I'll, I'm just going to go off on a little tangent here. I so, sorry, but you know, right. we came into a community that hadn't had junior hockey. So we that's had right. no in, in place billets. We had to recruit them all. Um, and the ones that we have have been just phenomenal, just really welcoming, really tremendously supportive of our program and not just the guys that live with them, but the, but the program as a whole. And, you know, I constantly, uh, get, get a reach out from, from various billet families, just asking if there's anything more they can do to help is there, you know, are they doing a great job and you know, all that sort of stuff. And the feedback from our players, from our families has been awesome on that front. So that's, but, there, but it's certainly an adjustment, you know, like you go through that. And I think that, you know, again, for the first month, everything's great. You know, the, the, the you made the spaghetti the right way. The, you know, the, they love the practices. Um, you know, everything's, everything comes up roses. It's really at this point in the year where the season is already long in some aspects compared to what guys who haven't played at this level before are used to. You know, in, in some of the instances, if you take a high school season, we may have already skated as many times as a high school team does in an entire, you know, three-month season because um, because we're on the ice every day. We don't have, you know, we have six days a week pretty much we're on the ice. So um, I think there's – I think that the challenges that we run into now are um, understanding – the commitment that it takes to play at this level and that it's not. So this is the only, and I, and I have this conversation with our guys more than once every year. This is the only time in their lives 
and certainly the first time in their lives, but likely the only time in their lives where when they get out of bed in the morning, hockey is the main, the main purpose for doing so that day. Yeah. Um, they don't, you know, some of our guys take classes, but that's not their main priority. Some of our guys work, that's not their main priority. Um, you know, the only other time they'll get to do that is if they're fortunate enough to be professional hockey players when it, when it's all said and done. Otherwise you have school as a priority. Um, you have other things and that's not to say you don't have other things that come up. Certainly, you know, you could have a family issue, you could have illness, health, things of that nature. So, um, but what that means that comes with a lot of responsibility in my eyes, you know, yeah. you need to get rest. You need to eat properly. You need to hydrate properly. Um, you know, our team lifts. I think there's only been one or two weeks since we've been here that we haven't lifted three times in a week. Uh, there are weeks where we've worked out four times when you throw in our yoga. So, you know, we, we put a lot of stock in and a lot of belief in the off ice part of what we do. Um, and there's account accountability on those, on, on those fronts. Um, you know, we talk about getting rest. Like I, I, when every game that we play comes with an itinerary that lists our curfew, you know, the night before every game. And, and, you know, we're kind of a standard 11 PM curfew uh, across the board. And, and we have guys that I know go to bed sometimes at, at nine 30. Um, and I think that's awesome. And so for us, it's about understanding that, um, those things are going to be an adjustment for a lot of guys. Um, you know, you're not getting up at six 15 in the morning to get to school for seven 30, you know, uh, your academic schedule might have you eating lunch, lunch at 10 30 in the morning. And, you know, then you're not getting meaningful food again until five o'clock. Like we don't have to worry about those things, but at the same time, we don't have to worry about those things. So, you know, being conscientious with those things is, is really, really important. So is that, is that amount of concentration or, and sometimes free time where you're not going, you got a kid that's been going, getting up, maybe, and even going to practice or the gym and then going to class and then, you know, going yeah. back to class and then going back to practice and then, you know, doing some homework in the car. You've, you've heard all the stories, right? Yeah, from the youth hockey player, and now they're getting, and they have a much more concentrated focus. But do some of the players uh, have a challenge with that? That you know, all of a sudden, you know, they're not able to challenge or, or channel that. Yeah, I think thing. it's. I you know, it's funny because I'll get the question sometimes in recruiting when we're dealing with players in the summer, like, is there extra ice available? Is there, you know, can I work with a skills coach or skating coach? And, you know, I always tell them the truth that there is extra ice available, you know, like pretty much every day that we get off after practice, there's stick time right behind us. So if a guy, you know, really wanted to stay and work on something and, you know, if a guy really wanted to go out of pocket to, to, to get a power skating instructor, yeah. but, you know, we have, you know, not every week, but most weeks, one day a week where we split into forwards for an hour, defensemen for an hour, goalies for an hour. We do some power skating. We do some skill specific. Um, I'm sorry, position specific skating and skill work. Yep. Um, and we have a two hour block every day. You know, in a typical week for us, we're going to practice um, eight to 10 hours. Uh, so like it's not and the intensity of our practice, I think, is is significantly more than what a lot of guys are used to early on. So, you know, and then we go, we get off the ice, we go to the gym and, you know, we hit the gym pretty hard. And so then we do we do all of our video now remotely like this, you know, by yep. Zoom. Um, yep. and, and honestly, like I've, I've become a, a complete devotee to that. I think it, I think it allows us to get, you know, instead of going practice, lift, video, trying to jam everything of importance into that you know there's a little bit of downtime in between guys can go get something to eat because you know a lot of our guys really struggle at the beginning with the nutrition piece and understanding just how much they actually have to eat and what foods they need to eat like they, they don't really understand it um they don't understand their caloric needs their macros they're, they're just you know we are, ironically have a, 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 a tomorrow night have a, a dietitian talking with our team about just planning their weeks and, and understanding what they need to do. So, you know, I can't talk about all those things and then not provide 
a path to be able to do those things. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think our guys end up being busier than they realize they will be when they get here, you know, yeah. and, and, and then, you know, once they're here and they settle into their routine, um, you know, we do have guys that take classes and guys that work, some guys that do a little bit of both. Um, they have to be smart about being proactive with those things, you know, getting a job. Like I always, I always joke about the jobs because, you know, in the summer, everyone tells me they're going to work. And then they get here and it's like, well, you know, I don't really want to work for $15 an hour. I don't really want to work in a restaurant. Either. So, all right. So you want a $60,000 a year desk job where you sit behind it, you sit behind a computer, you wear a shirt and tie and you have benefits and, and you're going to play junior hockey on top of that. Like you gotta understand like the best thing you can do. And the first time it snows, we'll have this conversation where I'll say, you know, Hey guys, it's supposed to snow in three days. You're the best thing you could do is go to home Depot, buy a bunch of shovels, hop in somebody's truck and just drive around driveway to driveway. You know, well, uh, you offer to shovel people's driveways for 25 bucks. You guys will make a killing. And they all <laughs> laugh and they all, you know, but I'm serious, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You, you wonder how many of them every year that are taken up on the offer. Right. Yeah. And, and, and the ironic thing is one of our guys who played for us last year has started his own business and he's doing that kind of stuff. You know, he's doing some home improvement things and he's doing some bigger contracting type things. But <clears throat> some of what he's doing is, uh, you know, is, is, is landscaping projects and things like that. And he's, and he's killing it. He's making really good money, put off going to college because he's doing so well right now. And he, nice. two of our guys work for him. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, if, if you're willing to hustle in life, there's still a lot of good things that, that can, that can come your way. So, but, but yeah, you know, our guys are busier than they think they're going to be. Um, they're more run down and tired. Um, you know, and listen, some of them come here, they've got a girlfriend that they're away from. They've got their family they're away from. They've got their buddies. Sometimes their buddies are off in college and, you know, texting them and telling them how great college is. Cause you know, I get to study all the time and I never, I never go out and have any beers with my buddies or anything like that. So, you know, I think our guys are sitting there. I think there's a little FOMO sometimes. They feel they feel like they're missing out on some stuff because they made a decision that's different than a lot of their peers. So um, when do you when do you see that? Is that is now? It, is it coming it out now? now? Yeah, it starts yeah. now. Yeah. You know, it, it really kicks up the, right around this time where guys start feeling like, okay, maybe I thought I was going to play a little bit more. I thought I would score a little bit more. I thought this transition would be a little bit easier in some way. Um, and not that it's not that they're struggling per se, but maybe they're not having the type of success that in their minds they thought they'd have. And then this is where our league label comes into play a little bit, especially our league. You know, I think there are guys that think they're, they think they're North American league players. Maybe they go to a camp or two. They don't make a team. They end up here. And I think, especially if they've never played at this level before, they think that, Oh, I'll just, well, I'll just go to the NA three and put up 60 points and, you know, I'll be up in the NA in no time. And yeah. they get here and, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have a point a game over the first dozen games. They, you know, they might only have a handful of points right now and now they're pressing and, you know, now I gotta score. And uh, you know, we both know that once the word gotta comes in, that's where the struggles, you know, start to start to really take hold a little bit. So two, two things um, that I want to, that I want to hone in on there. And then, and, and that is, so what is, what is the, What's the big differentiation between when they're in this time? Because you've seen it, not just here, but 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 uh, in other places. It's the same, it's the same at the college level. It's yeah. A, you know, it might be a little bit easier at the college level because the guys are older. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're a li they're, they've already kind of gone through it at a previous level. They're a little more worldly, but it's not it's not all that dissimilar to be but, honest. But what but what makes the you know, it's predictable that it's going to happen. You may not exactly know that you think that this guy is going to be yeah. able to handle it. You, you just don't know until you no. get there, right? Right, right. But what is the big thing that, that is it just kind of mental fortitude? Is it just... Um, it's a little bit of that, but I, I think the bigger thing is being, having the emotional maturity and the toughness it takes to reinvent yourself in your own mind. And to understand that everything you've done up till now has worked at previous levels, but you're at a different level now. So you've got to be able to do different things. 
you can't continue to do the same things at a new level and have the same success. And, and, the, and that is, I, I want to hone in on that, that phrase to reinvent yourself. But what you're saying is not someone else to reinvent you, but no, you need them to, to reinvent themselves. You need to understand. So, so the thing that I say to our guys is my job isn't to hang banners in our rank. My job, and as I see it, is to lay the foundation to, okay, so our guys come to us, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm making this metaphor up on the fly as I go, but I really do believe this is, uh, this is the way it works. Our guys come to us as a, as a wheelbarrow load of bricks, you know, and our job is to start to lay a foundation with those bricks for them to be the best 24 or 25-year-old player that they can really be. Because quite frankly, when I worked for Jim Ward at Connecticut College, he used to say this all the time. We want, we, we always wanted at Con our players' best games to be their very last game. So when you peel off that jersey and, and at the college level, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, the, the guy takes off that jersey the last time, it's the last time he's ever going to wear a, competitive, a, a jersey in a competitive setting. So you want to be the best player you can possibly be at the very end of your senior year of your college career. Um, and that's always resonated with me. And um, yep. it's stuck with me as I've gone, you know, then step back from the college level to work with younger players that I think that's, that's my job is to, you know, could we do a couple of things differently and maybe win a handful more hockey? That's the other thing that I think people get twisted. If we did a couple of things differently, we wouldn't be a, a 45 win team in a 47 game season, we might win a handful more games, yeah. right? So if I'm going to cut corners on development to, at, for the sake of winning, we might win a couple more games, but at the end of the day, it's not going to make an appreciable difference in our win total. So I've gone the other way where we're just going to, we're going to develop, you know, we're going to allow guys to make mistakes. We're going to allow guys to grow. Doesn't mean I'm going to be happy about those mistakes. Doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be really direct and really firm about that's a mistake that can't happen because it's a mental one. Um, physical mistakes are, are part of the game. They're part of life. They're going to happen. So, um, you know, I think for us, it's embracing this is what you're going to be. This is the type of forward you're going to be. You're going to be, you know, a guy who has some skill, but maybe isn't what we call a skill forward. You need to be heavy. You need to be F1 on the forecheck. You need to finish plays. You need to be conscientious on our breakouts. You need to be smart with your positioning. You need to be active with your stick. And you're going to get your goals, but you're not a goal scorer. And I think when guys embrace that, when a particular player embraces that and, and, and is able to articulate what he needs to do well for not only for him to show his best game to anybody who's evaluating him, but also for his team to have success, you know, that's when I think we have something. And then yeah. from there, your role, the roles within your team become defined by, you know, these are the guys that do these things well, and they're going to be power play guys. These are the guys that do these things well, and they're going to be penalty kill guys. Like one of the things we've done this year is last night I, I broke away from it a little bit. But for most of the season this year, we've used separate guys on the power play and the penalty kill forwards, especially, um, you know, so uh, and, and we and we talk, you know, we have a game plan for, before the game where we talk about that pretty openly. You know, these are our power play units. These are the guys that are on it. These are our penalty kill forwards. So guys go into the game understanding that when the referee's arm goes up and one of our guys goes to the box, I'm going to be playing in the next two minutes and, and I've got to be dialed in on what I need to do. Referee's arm goes up and one of their guys goes in the box. I'm not going to be playing, but this other guy is, and he yeah. needs to know what he's going to be doing and he needs to execute. And, you know, for the most part, our specialty teams have been pretty good. I'd like to see our power play be a little bit more consistent at times, but you know, it, it hasn't been, it hasn't been where we need it to be just yet, but I, I, I don't think it's a complete overhaul away from being where we want it to be. And our penalty kills been, I've been absolutely thrilled with our penalty kill. And I, and I think that defining the roles, has, has contributed to that in some, in some fashion. So what's the uh, kind of wrapping it up a little bit here? Cause I, uh, we can talk for hours on, on hockey, but if, if you're, if you're that kid now that is first year away, you know, what do you tell them? How do you, how do you find that, that inner voice to, um, uh, to, 
to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say two things. First, I tell every kid and family before they get here that there's going, there are going to be periods of growth and periods where you feel like you're, you've stagnated a bit. And so, you know, everybody takes off like a rocket ship in the first, you know, couple of weeks, month, everybody feels like they're only, you know, I'm getting better every day. And then they hit they, at, at, at differing times, they hit that plateau. And they hit that, that period where they feel like they're maybe not getting better at the same rate that they were at the beginning and, and you know, that the league's catching up to them or whatever. Um, and then the guys who really succeed are the ones who can shorten that period the most, who can keep that plateau as small as possible and get to that next rocket ship point, that next kick up in development. And, and, and so, you know, so we do talk about it before they even get here. You know, we talk about it when we talk, you know, because I think a lot of coaches sell, oh, you're going to come here, you're going to play on the first line, you're going to be on the power play, you're going to score a million points. Well, maybe you are, but, you know, you're going to struggle at times too. Um, you know, so we've talked about it once or twice as a team already. We'll talk about it again this week. Um, and then I think the second part is, you know, the very first question you got to ask yourself is how much do I really love this? You know, how much do I really, and, 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 and my wife has done a presentation similar to this and, and I'm putting one together. It's similar. And I see it right now with my nine-year-old, like my nine-year-old loves hockey right now. Like it's fun, you know, but where we're going for pizza or are we going to McDonald's after practice is still equally important to the hockey part of it. Cause it's fun. It's a puppy dog crush. Um, you know, so you like it first, then you love it. Uh, but what we're asking our guys to do is live it. So you go from like to love and everybody has that love period, but not everybody gets to, to live it. Not everybody gets to that point. Um, it's not for everybody. So is this, is this really what you want to do? Do you want to be away from home, not going to college while your buddies are being away from those things, you know, having a, you know, a, a 48 year old man, you know, giving you grief about, but what you're doing, is that really what you want to be doing? You know, is that, do you have a real passion for that? Um, and if you do, then what you have to do is, is be open-minded to coaching input, um, be willing to fail, be willing to be vulnerable in order to grow. And if you can't do those things, you're going to really, really struggle. Now, you know, I make the point of pride for me is, you know, not giving up on players. So, you know, it's going to take a lot for us to say, you know, hey, Jacob, it's just really not working for you. We got to get you ready. We're going to trade you to, you know, to, to Great Falls, Montana or, or Austin, Texas or whatever, you know, um, because they have a need for you. And, and, and we think it's a better situation for you. It, it takes a lot for me to get to that point. And usually, frankly, it takes you know, some bad citizenship for me to get to that point. So, yeah. um, but you know, like it, it's a challenging process and I do think, but I think the players have to own it. I think the players have to understand that uh, constructive criticism is that, uh, that direct feedback is, is intended to be, is love, you know, feedback is love. If you didn't care, you wouldn't share. And so I think for our guys understanding that and for young players understanding that, and for a lot of them, you know, a lot of them, a lot of our guys were high school superstars or, you know, midget superstars. And, you know, they get here and they're good players. Don't get me wrong. They're good players. And, and the nice thing about our team is I feel like, I feel like every guy has had, you know, some sort of moment or, or collection of moments and means where they feel like they've legitimately contributed to our team's success. So I don't feel like we're in a place where we have, you know, 20 guys who are riding along contributing and four or five guys that feel like they're, they're just here for the, for to, 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 you know, to fill out the roster. And so I, but you know, how do you get through that? You know, I, again, I, I think you have to decide for yourself, for yourself. And it's not, you're not doing it for your parents. You're not doing it for your buddies. You're doing it for you, that this is where, where you really want to be. And you really want to be in this grind um, and then be open, just be really, really open. Trust your coach, Trust that your coach has your best interest at heart. Trust that your teammates care about you and want to see you succeed because, you know, we have some guys who are really good players who are willing to, you know, grab a guy and you know, put their arm around him and say, Hey, we need you to do this, you know, so that we can be successful as a team and, and you need to do it for yourself. Yeah. 
Well, I think that it's uh, people ought to be, you know, um, hope, I hope people get interested and, and look you up. Um, I think so. What's the what's the best way to reach you for people who are interested in in the sea captains? Yeah, um, you know, email is great. Uh, my email is really easy. It's just my name, Kevin Cunningham, K E V I N C U N N I N G H A M, the number four at hotmail.com. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good about getting back to emails within, you know, 24, 48 hours. Um, you know, our website has my contact on it too. It's norwichseacaptains.com. Yep. Um, you know, we're, 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 we got to do some updates there. We're a little behind on some of our game stories, but, um, you know, we'll be, uh, like that, that's, uh, there's a lot of information there. We try to keep our you know, little things like keeping our statistics current and things like that. Cause I, I think that matters to kids nowadays and, and, it, and we have the technology to do it. So, so we try to do it right. So. Yeah. That, I went in and looked at it and it was updated from the game last night. So, uh, yeah. And uh, thus, the, why, why your uh, voice is a little hoarse. But, yeah, a little bit. little bit. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, thanks for jumping on. Always a pleasure. And, uh, and, and thanks for hosting us again last, last season. We were up yeah, in Connecticut. And uh, I know a lot of the parents and a lot of the kids enjoyed it. And uh, if you're up in that area, on the, in the Connecticut area, look them up. And, uh, and uh, I know you can o- also catch some of the games there on the on – the, on the uh, NA3 channel. Yeah, Hockey TV, where all of our games are webcast. And, um, yeah, if anybody's ever in the area, I mean, the one thing I, I love doing is showing off our program and talking about junior hockey generally. I think there's a lot of – there are a lot of ideas, and some of them are dead on, but there's also a lot of misinformation out there about junior hockey. And I think anytime I, – I, I believe in it as a product, whether it's the Norwich Sea Captains or, you know, another – hopefully well-run program. I believe that there are a ton of benefits to junior hockey that extend far beyond the ice. So I'm, I'm a huge supporter of it in all capacities and, and, and I would promote it. And I would, I wish I had played more junior hockey when I was that age, you know, I, I played one season while I was still living at home and then went to college, I would have benefited from playing longer. Um, and so I, you know, I mean, I, I look at it, like I said, my son's nine, I have no idea if he's going to play junior hockey or not. But if he's still playing at that age, like I would want him to have experiences like this. I think that they're, I think that they help uh, young men really grow up and, and really learn about themselves and learn about the path that they want to take, uh, hopefully for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Well, awesome stuff. Thanks again, Kevin. My pleasure.